Hello everybody, this video is on how to draw tables and graphs in scientific reports. Tables and graphs are common and clear ways that you can present your data to readers in your scientific reports. Tables should be enclosed, whether you're drawing them on paper or on your computer. The headers or headings of the table should contain the name of your variables, that is your independent and dependent variables, as well as the units of each variable. For example here, I have my time, my independent variable, accompanied by the unit which is second and my dependent variable that is distance accompanied by my unit of meters. The table legend that is a description of the table information should be written above the table. While it should be concise, it should be informative enough for the reader to understand the context of your numbers without reading through other parts of your results. So here I have table one, distance traveled by a runner over time, which is here you can see five seconds. If the dependent variables that you present in a table are measured and not calculated, they must have consistent decimal places. For example, if the distance measured in this table are using a measuring tape, which only gives you measurements to one decimal place, then all your numbers should have one decimal place, which is why I've written 5.0 all the way to 25.0. The number of decimal places of your measured data depends on the precision. How precise is your measuring equipment? The more precise your measuring equipment is, the more number of decimal places you will present in your table. However, if the numbers you present are from calculations, if they're calculated, where the calculations are also included in the analysis section in the results, then the numbers must have consistent significant figures rather than decimal places. So here, my calculations tell me that my numbers must all have three significant figures. So the first number is 5.00 and every other number all have three significant figures. Graphs can also be a good way to present your data to the audience in a clear and concise manner. A comprehensive graph includes a title, axes with correct variables and corresponding units, also with an appropriate scale, which allow data points to be plotted such that they cover at least 75% of the entire graph. Once your axes are drawn, and then your data points can be plotted using crosses by convention. On the right hand side, I have an example of a graph of distance versus time. What may not be obvious to you is that there are numerous incorrect features of this graph that can be improved. We'll go through these individually. The first component that can be improved is its title. The title of distance versus time is too simple, as it only repeats the labels of the axes. Instead, the title should provide more information, such as the context of the graph. Instead of just distance versus time, distance traveled by a runner over time provides the reader more context and therefore understanding of what the data points represent. The second feature that's incorrect about this graph is the placement of the, of the variables on the x and y axes. Time, which is the independent variable of this experiment, is incorrectly placed on the y axis. And the dependent variable distance is also incorrectly placed on the x-axis. The positions on the graph should be switched around. Your independent variable, such as time, should always be placed on the x-axis. And therefore, your dependent variable, such as distance, should always be placed on the y-axis. The third problem with this graph is that both the scale of the x and y-axis are too large. This results in the five data points occupying only a small area, less than half to be exact, of the entire graph. Remember that a good graph requires the data points to cover at least 75% of the whole area. Values beyond 30 on the x-axis and beyond 25 on the y-axis are not being used as there are simply no data points in these ranges. As such, an appropriate improvement that can be made is to make the scales smaller. Instead of going to 40, my y-axis now goes to 20. And instead of going to 50, my x-axis now goes to 25. This allows the same five data points to be plotted, but now spread over a bigger area covering almost the entire graph. Therefore, before you plot your data points, you need to plan ahead. You need to ask yourself, do my x and y axes have the correct scale so that my data points can cover an appropriate area that's not too small nor too large. Once your graph is correctly drawn and the data points are plotted, then you can choose to draw a straight line of best fit. 
This will give a more clear representation of the trend that's given by your data points. When drawing the line of best fit, it is important for you to first identify and then exclude any outliers. For example, in the five data points, the second data is clearly an outlier as it is far away from the straight line that is formed by the other four data points. There are two common mistakes that are often made by beginners when they're drawing the line of best fit. First of all, the line of best fit does not need to pass through the origin. It doesn't need to pass through the zero zero point, especially if there's no data point there. Secondly, your line of best fit should be contained within your data points between the first and last crosses. If the line of best fit goes beyond the first or beyond the last data point, this is what we call extrapolation. You're predicting that the trend will hold up outside your experimental results. Now, most of the time, this may be a good assumption. The trend may hold up outside your results, but sometimes they may not. So it is invalid for you to draw a line of best fit beyond the data points you've obtained from the experiment without performing the actual experiment for those values. This graph shows what the line of best will look like if the outlier that we identified earlier was not excluded. You can see the whole line of best fit will be shifted towards the outlier, giving this a slightly smaller slope. Ultimately, this will affect your final value when you perform the analysis of your results. This graph shows you what happens if your line of best fit passes through the origin. Now, in this case, this has also affected the slope on my straight line as forcing the straight line to pass to the origin has reduced its slope. The line of best fit on the graphs on the left and right also extend beyond the experimental data points. They go beyond the first and last data points. This form of extrapolation should be done using dashed lines instead of your solid lines that you're using for drawing the line of best fit. A common question students often ask is when do you draw a curve of best fit rather than a line of best fit? Curve of best fit are appropriate depending on two main factors. First of all, your plot of data points must resemble a curved trend rather than a straight line trend. And second of all, you need to also consider is the curve trend appropriate and expected in your experiments? In other words, are you expecting a curved relationship between your independent and dependent variables? So this is related to the hypothesis you would have already made in the beginning of your experiment. So both the trend presented by the plot of data and the context of the results in the experiment should be considered when deciding is a curve of best fit more appropriate or a straight line of best fit more appropriate. The example I've given you here, which has a curve of best fit, is the volume of gas produced over time from the reaction between hydrochloric acid and sodium carbonate. In this graph, not only do the data points resemble a curve relationship, it is also reasonable for us to see a curve trend between volume and time. And this is because the rate of the reaction between the two substances decreases over time, which results in smaller amounts of volume produced per second. For straight lines of best fit, the experimental results can be further analyzed by calculating its gradient, that is, its slope. The gradient should be calculated using two pairs of data on the line of best fit. And you should select the two pairs of data that are on grid lines, and these tend to be more accurate. So here, on this line of best fit, I've decided to pick these two data points as they clearly intersect the grid lines on my graph. When calculating the gradient, you should avoid using the plot of data by themselves and avoid using only one pair of data. The reason why we are using data on the line of best fit because this accounts for all the data points you've gathered in the experiment and therefore the results that you calculate is far more accurate than using the raw data points themselves. In other words, instead of using these crosses to calculate the gradient, we are using variable points on my straight line to calculate the gradient. This will produce more accurate results. You should also avoid using only one pair of data, for example, using this one here, because this approach will only work if your line of best fit passes through the origin, that is, if your relationship is a directly proportional one. In most cases, if your line of best fit does not pass through the origin, you need to pick at least two pairs of data on your straight line to calculate the gradient. And of course, 
avoid using data that are between the grid lines as these are much more difficult to determine the values of. So that's calculate the gradient. We'll pick these two pairs of data points to calculate my gradient. The gradient is given by the rise divided by the run. The rise is a change in y value. So we have 10 meters minus the y value of the bottom point, which is over here. The middle point here is 7.5 because it's halfway between 5 and 10. Between 7.5 and 10, there are a value of 2.5. So because the bigger box is divided into five smaller boxes, each of these smaller boxes represents a value of 0.5. So because this point here is one small box above 7.5, this is a value of 8.0. Divided by the run, which is a change in horizontal value. The horizontal value here of the higher point, so this is 2.5 in the middle, which is halfway between 2.0 and 3.0. There's a changing value of 0.5 here. And again, the bigger box is divided into five smaller boxes. So one small box is 0.5 divided by five. So you get 0.1. This point here is two smaller boxes after 2.5. So it'd be 2.7. 2.7 minus the initial X value is right on 2.0. So that makes it easier for us to determine. And this gives me a value of 2.9 as the gradient. When you're calculating the gradient, it is important to supply the number with the appropriate units as well. The unit here is a unit of the y-axis divided by the unit of the x-axis, so meters per second. After considering the units, this will also help you understand the meaning of the gradient you just calculated. This number here, 2.9 meters per second, is actually the velocity of the object whose distance was analyzed over time on the graph. So for this particular graph, we can say that because we have drawn a straight line of best fit, that means the gradient of the straight line is constant at 2.9 meters per second. The velocity of the object was also constant at 2.9 meters per second. This concludes the video on how to draw tables and graphs.